I want to talk this morning, and, and it's following on a little bit from last Sunday. What does a changed life look like? Um, Friday morning, I was just over at um, Riverlink, and uh, just being served by someone over there, and they um, leant over as if they were going to say something quietly. And those of you who know me well, know me that if someone <laughs> says something quietly to me, I have to lips, lip read, because I don't often catch what they say. So I leant as far over as I could without it looking quite ridiculous. And they said to me, they said, what does it mean to be unequally yoked? Now, this is not what people over at Riverlink normally say to me, you understand? <laughs> so in equally hushed tones, I tried to very briefly explain that when Paul used this term, he was encouraging the Christians not to marry those who were not Christians. And then I, was, I just said, but there's a further application that, that just in our own day, that um, when a couple are going to get married, I, I just said, because I know this is someone who, who was thinking very much toward, toward a future marriage, that, that I, I just said, you also have to make sure that your heart and your hunger for God, and their heart, and their hunger for God, the call on your life, the call on their life, match in some way. Because you may marry someone who's a Christian, but then find out that once you get married, that, that, uh, that they just want to live a very fleshly lifestyle, and it's not, it's, it's not going to be a real uh, wonders. Uh, in some ways, you may experience wonders, but, but that, that soul wonders that you look for in marriage, just won't, won't happen to you. And I was, I was kind of thinking about, about um, situations where uh, people had married someone who was, who was not, uh, that they just couldn't share their life with the same way. Uh, because where that other person was at and where they're at, just, they're, they're just on, on different levels. And so um, sometimes the other person was a Christian and, and even though they were a Christian, there was just not that, that closeness in terms of um, hunger for God and companionship and, and call of God. And of course, sometimes when that person isn't a Christian, there's going to be an incredible limit on, on just what they, can, what they can share together. And I just know that it's changing uh, and, the, and the changes that are, that, that are needed in our lives and, and even in, in marriage. I mean, people often when they get married think, oh, you know, it'll be just really great. And it'll just be everything that we didn't have before and now we'll have it together. And not, not realising that, that marriage involves change for both parties, doesn't it? All right. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, it's, it's, it's really hard to make changes when the one who is nearest to you doesn't want to make the change. That's when it becomes really, really hard. And, and perhaps when you, you both realise that you, you, you need to, to change, but only one is really, really willing to change. So I just want to touch a little bit on what, what this change looks like. Um, I spoke last Sunday on uh, First Steps to a Changed Life, and I um, explained uh, in, in just two major points that uh, Jesus, when he was going to share with his disciples a, a, a crucial truth that would be a turning point for them, that he actually was the Messiah. That I said that he took them to a quiet place, he took them to Caesarea Philippi, which is right up the very, very north, a very, very quiet, quiet area in that day. And I, I just said how if, we, if we're going to experience change, if Christ is going to change us, there are times when we do have to turn down all the other stuff going on around us. Because we do have so much stuff going on. We have so much stuff that is vying for our attention. Um, it'll be different things for different people. For some, it'll be music. Uh, be Facebook for some, console games, Netflix, television, um, Stan. And there's one I saw the other day that brings most of those together. I don't remember what it was called, but it brings just about everything together. And with one remote, and I thought, my goodness, how many Australian men will think, heaven on earth? <laughs> it won't be heaven on earth, I can assure you. But, but all this stuff vies for our attention. And I, I did say last week that uh, if the stuff you're filling your head with is too loud, then you do have to turn it down. 
then if the stuff that you're filling your head with is wrong, you have to turn it off. If, if, we, if we, we're going to live for Christ, if we're going to experience His change in our, our life, some things we have to turn down, some things we have to, we have to turn off. Then the um, second thing we uh, talked about last week, I said how we have to lift Jesus up. If they, we're going to experience change, we, we have to lift Him up. And our own church's mission statement, Vision Christian Family's mission statement says that our mission is to be a caring and empowering community of God's people, bringing healing and restoring hope. Now, catch this through ongoing, life-changing encounters with Jesus Christ. See, when um, someone says, oh, when I, yeah, I had an encounter with Christ that happened 10 years back or 15 years back or 20 years back or 30 years back, and that changed my life. And I think that's absolutely wonderful. I mean, I look back at a much longer time. I look back 52 years when, when Christ, uh, when I encountered Christ for the first time and Christ came into my life and there were a, a dramatic change. But over the last 52 years, there's been, there's been encounter after encounter after encounter after encounter. And if I just said, oh, you know, I, I met Christ 52 years back. And, and it's just been uh, moving on since then. Oh, there's been no great en encounter with him since then. If there'd been no great encounter with him, I'd be going backwards. And I would no, for the first couple of years, I did go backwards because I had no further encounters with Christ. So if we're going to change, if we're going to experience change, there has to be ongoing encounters with Christ. And those encounters can be life-changing. So I just read that, that last part again. Uh, restoring her through ongoing, life-changing encounters with Jesus Christ. The life we live, very obviously, is a reflection of our relationship with Christ. If, if you don't know someone real well and, and you just begin talking with them and the person is a Christian, you get some idea pretty quickly where they're at with, with the Lord. And then if it's someone you know, uh, just by talking with them, you may not have seen them a little while. You, you, just, you just listen carefully and you get an idea about where they're at with Christ. Because our life will be a reflection of where we're, we're at with Christ. And we finished last week with this uh, wonderful scripture from 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 18. We who with unveiled faces, and of course it's a picture of uh, Moses in the Old Testament who had known the presence of God, and, and because the people did not know the presence of God, Moses had to wear a veil. And But Paul is saying that we, the church together, we all individually are unveiled because we come into the presence of God, we know the glory of God, but we don't have to wear a veil because we all have access into the presence and glory of God. And then so as we, as we continue in that presence, the sense of God's glory over us, it, is, it immerses us and immerses us and immerses us. I love it when I do come across Christians who have been Christians a long time and who truly know and there's a real sense of the joy of, joy of the Lord on the in, inside. I found out that... The, Excuse me, this last week, I don't remember the uh, chorus, but the, the uh, song rather, but the chorus is, The Joy of the Lord is My Strength. What's that song? Joy of the Lord is My Strength. Oh, The Joy of the Lord is My Strength. All right, yeah. That's um, pretty straightforward, isn't it? <laughs> and I couldn't remember any other words to the song, but the chorus kept coming back to me, and I, I thought, I, I just love to meet Christians who've walked with Christ a long time. And, and honestly, there is a very real joy on, on the inside because they, they encounter Christ. They lift Christ up in their life. So what I want to do this morning is to take it a little bit further. What does that changed life look like? And I'm in, I'm in Mark chapter 8, which is where we were last week. And I'm reading from verse 31. And it said, he began to teach them. This is after he, uh, they have come to that revelation that he is the Christ, the Messiah. Verse 31. Mark chapter 8. He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things, be rejected by the elders, chief priests, teachers of the law, that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this, 
Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of me. So the first thing that I'm saying, Christ brings us into a new way of thinking. A new way of thinking. When you were born again, oh, here, let me put the next slide up. When you were born again, the Holy Spirit came to live in you. And from that very moment that He came to live in you, He began to do a changing work. But you know, you will not change beyond the way you think. And so if you think in a very negative way, and then you're trying to make positive changes, you find it incredibly difficult. But if the Spirit of God can change your thinking, then He can change your behavior. So it begins with the way we think. It begins with the way we think. I think in my, um, uh, let me just say this, one day you and I will be in heaven. I hope everyone here one day will be in heaven. Do you think that you will think in heaven differently to the way you think now? I certainly hope I will think differently. And I don't mean that, that I don't ever think godly. I, 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 think of, I think a lot of godly. But there are times when I don't think godly, but in heaven there won't be any of that. And so I think that when I'm in heaven, I will think differently to the way I think now. But see, it's not like, well, I became a Christian 52 years back, and now I just have to hang on with all this stuff going through my head, and then one day I'll be with the Lord Jesus in heaven, and then I'll think differently. But for, for the last 52 years, the Spirit of God has been challenging the way I think. And saying, Jeff, if you think differently, you will act differently. But it begins with the way you think. Sometimes, and, and I think this is true in the um, uh, early, early days, sometimes I, uh, someone might say, oh, uh, I'll just pick a name, John Smith. John Smith down the road is a Christian and he said such and such. So that must be the way Christians think. My goodness. Imagine if John Smith voted for any particular... I won't, I've got to name a party. But not. Maybe John Smith voted for a particular party. And then someone who's not a Christian said, oh, that means the Christians will vote for that party. I certainly hope not. Not if it's the party that I've got in mind anyway. <laughs> so our thinking is increasingly, as we yield and let the Spirit of God change it, increasingly we think the way the Holy Spirit wants us to think. But because you're a Christian, if you say, well, I'm a Christian now, so the way I think must be the way God wants me to think, well, that's, that's like saying, well, I'm a Christian now, so everything I do must be what God wants me to do, including the bad stuff. God doesn't want you to do the bad stuff, and He doesn't want you to think the wrong stuff either. It is a progressive change. It is a progressive change that He is doing in us. So, um, let me go this way. Let me just read to you, now just say, like I'm, I'm in my own devotional life, I'm, I'm reading through, I follow the readings from the notice sheet, I, I follow the long readings, and then as I read through the New Testament passage, then I will type up something. I, when we went away, I had it on a, on a flash drive, my favourite flash drive, that decided, had enough now, time to die. <laughs> Not sure whether my flash drive went to heaven, but all of its content disappeared. All of its content disappeared. All of its content disappeared. The good thing was there's been stuff there for a couple of years and kind of a rule, if you don't use something for a couple of years, you don't really need it, true? <laughs> Until it disappears. <laughs> then you need it. But it's my, my habit to, to always type up something from what I, I read. Because I don't want a situation where I'm just reading the Bible and, and then just going away. Like James said, you look, you look in the mirror, you see yourself, and then you forget what you look like. Now, some of you would like to, to do that. But, but the Scripture shows us, shows us where we're at, shows us Christ in that sense. So I'm, I'm looking to see, God, how can I be more like that? Now, I just picked out a, a fairly easy scripture to, um, to apply. Uh, this is one from uh, Luke chapter 6. Um, 
But to you who are listening, I say this, Jesus would love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who mistreat you. Someone slaps you on the cheek, turn to them the other also. Someone takes your coat, do not withhold your shirt from them. Now, do you think that if you had read that, there might be something you'd be able to type up? <laughs> if you have a sensitive heart to God, there would be something that you can type up. Because situations happen where someone does something, they wrong us in some way, and it tests what's in the heart, because what's in the heart comes out. Um, for instance, you know, just say someone uh, does something to me and I find myself telling other people about it and I name the other person. Is that what Jesus said to do? No, no, no. no. I think it was um, D.A. Carson said the only time you should put another Christian down is when you put their name down on your prayer list. <laughs> That's a good one, isn't it? <laughs> See, so, so I, I would type it and I'm saying, God, I'm thinking of so-and-so, I'm thinking of something that, that happened. And I say, God, forgive me because I told other people, I named the person. In that sense, I put that other, other person down. And see, what I'm doing, I, I'm allowing the, 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 the reading of Scripture on a daily basis, I'm reading that to be um, applied to me. And see, this is to me the, uh, the, the, the principal way that I find that, that, that God changes my, my thinking. If I'm going to be a disciple of Christ, I have to let the Holy Spirit get God's Word into me. If you're going to be a disciple of Christ, then Jesus didn't come to get a bunch of converts. He came to get disciples. Go into all the world and make disciples of the nations. So we have to be a people who, who, who allow the, the truth of God's Word to get into us, to get into us on a daily basis. And if you're not someone who spends uh, some time each day, and on our, another sheet we've got short readings, medium readings, long reading. The short readings only take about two minutes. Two minutes. That's all it takes for most of them anyway. And, and then the medium readings lot longer, the longer readings of course longer. But it's, it's applying it, it's allowing the Spirit of God to take the Word of God. Get that Word into our life. And, and, and the, I think when Jesus comes into someone's life and as we walk with Him, there's an ongoing challenge to our way of thinking. The next one. Christ brings us into a new way of living. And the next verse in, in Mark chapter 8 says, Then he called the crowd, verse 34, to him along with his disciples and said, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. Whoever wants to save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for me and the gospel will save it. Read a bit further, verse 36, What good is it for a man to gain the whole world but prof yet forfeit his own soul? What can a man give in exchange for his soul? All right, so, so Jesus is going to talk about three things about changing behavior. First thing he says is deny yourself. Deny yourself. Um, uh, I guess it's, it's, it's a, a, a truism anyway, but the more of Christ there is in you, the less of self there is. But the more of self there is, the less of Christ there is. And, and we only begin to, to, to see this when we come before God and say, God, well, I don't think I have a problem with denying myself, but God, should there be a little problem in there, would you show me? God loves prayers like that. He especially loves it when we say, should there be a little problem? And he begins to lift stuff. And then perhaps something happens to you where you have a choice. And the choice is to deny yourself or to, or to go the very opposite way, and you find yourself not denying yourself, but going the opposite way. And you say, God, it was only this morning I said, if I have a problem in this area. And now I see just circumstance. Life is showing me that there's stuff in there that I still want me to be, to be maybe not on, on the throne, but, but I still want me. There's too much of me. There's far too much of me. And I can say after 52 years of, of, of being a Christian, there is still far too much of Jeff Wilson in me. 
And I don't mean that we, we come to a place where we, where we say, and, and, I mean, I remember in um, early charismatic days hearing a, um, hearing a very famous um, uh, charismatic leader say so on a particular day, that particular, who that person was, they said that person died on that day. And I remember thinking, God, let me know that experience where I can truly say I have completely died and there's nothing in me and it's all of Christ. I tell you, after 52 years, we've made a couple of steps, but there's an awfully long way to go. But I'm not stopping because of that. And I, I want there to be more of Christ by the time I finish here on earth. I want there to be more of Christ and less of Jeff Wilson than there is right now. And, and that's what I'm asking of you, that, that Jesus said that as you walk with him, there will be a denial of self, a denial of self, a denial of self. You know, I think, um, I think for, for so many Western Christians, you know, they think, oh, uh, denying myself is, oh, look, the um, offering plate came around and, look, you know, uh, they gave such a heavy talk about giving before this, uh, it's only going to put in two dollars, but I think I'll put in three. <laughs> You know, um, uh, Australian Christians are not known around the world for their generosity. I wish we were. But we're not known for our generosity. I remember one of the early versions of Operation World that goes right through the uh, 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 nations of the earth. And when they would talk about Australia, uh, at one stage they had talked about how little we give toward missions. Because as a people, we, you know, just we just want to be satisfied. We we say this is this is what what we want. And then, of course, when it comes to election time, so many of the promises are targeted at you. You will have more under my leadership. The other one, no, you'll have more under my leadership. I'm waiting for someone to say the country will do better under my leadership. So. So it's like there's, there's something in us, even as, Australian, even as Aussie Christians, that, that has to be broken because we are still, in that sense, a very self-centered people. And as I said, our giving is, um, is known and is, and is sometimes noted for that. Uh, uh, next thing, uh, just in uh, verse 35, we, we read it. Jesus said, whoever wants to save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for me, for the gospel, will save it. And, and so uh, uh, there is a, a great need to make Jesus your safety and security. Now, I may not have the uh, numbers clear uh, with this. I'm trying to remember a story that I just heard last week. One of the uh, speakers at the conference I uh, was at last week, uh, and I don't even remember this guy's name clearly. It was a name very much like Oscar Mayuri. He's um, a Kenyan uh, pastor, a man, who, when he gives altar calls, now this is what he said. He said, um, he said he'd come from a, a, a conference, and I think, that, as I said, the uh, numbers wise, I'm just going on uh, memory, I'll go from the numbers I wrote down here. He said it was a, a conference of about 2,000 young people. It was, I think, it was just in an African nation. He said at the end he asked everyone to stand. Then he outlined the, the demands of discipleship. The only one of those willing to meet those demands to remain standing and, and about 1,000 sat down. Of the 2,000 standing, about half, about 1,000 um, sat down. Then of those thousand who were left standing, he, he challenged them and he said, now, how many of you are willing to go to any nation around the world? Now, now, now here's a man who I think in something like 12 or 13 years has founded 260 churches. And they are in, not in, in, just in Africa, most of them are, but they are now all over the world. In fact, he's looking at Australia, looking at Brisbane, Sydney, Melbourne and Perth to begin churches. Um, he explained, and I was telling some of the folk in the um, kitchen, he said, Africans, when we, when we think of what you do for God, we think differently to uh, Westerners. He said, it's like if you went out on a shooting range. And he said, um, this is how Westerners think. You get a rifle and it's going to be a shooting range, and you, you look up and, and, and they tell you, and you go through all the stuff, and they say, on the count of three, pull the trigger. And he said, uh, so, you know, the Westerner gets there, and... One, oh, then he stops, he has to think about it. Yep, yeah, all right. Start again, you know. One, two, oh, I think I'll go and do a course. So he does a course on how to fire a rifle. 
Then he comes back and, and he goes again. One, two, oh, will there be much, much kickback? I'm really concerned. My shoulder, you know, it might really hurt me. He said, he said, finally, after who knows how long, finally, he finally pulls the trigger. He said, an uh, African, we gave them a rifle, and he said, this is how they think about the growth of Christianity. They say, on the count of three, I want you to pull the trigger. The African gets the rifle, and he goes, one, bang! <laughs> he said, that's why the church in Africa is exploding. He said, that's why the church in Australia is not. He said, the uh, Western church is like a rhino church. He said, rhino, um, gestation period, for the mother growing the little baby rhino, somewhere between 18 months and two years. So she, she carries that little rhino for 18 months or two years. And then when it's born, she'll get born to just one, I, I think they're called a calf, one, one calf. Then she has to look after that calf for three years before it's fully independent. Before it can uh, just see its own way round. And she said during that time, it, it, it takes an enormous amount of food, enormous amount of grass. It just had to be fed, 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 fed. He said, that's the Western church. He said, the uh, African church is a rabbit church. <laughs> Gestation period, six weeks. Number of baby, what do they call baby rabbits? Kittens. 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 He said, not one, not two. As many, I just forget the number, six, seven, eight. And he said, uh, he said one in three baby rhinos doesn't make it after, after three years. But he said, almost all the rabbits do. And he said, after, and I, I forget the amount of time, something like three months or something like that, the baby rabbits are ready to go. He said, you don't have to, to, to get a whole lot of food and ready for it. It just finds its own food. He said, you see the difference between the Western church and the African church? He said, you're a bunch of rhinos, which first of all we thought was good until he explained what it meant. <laughs> he said, the African church is like, is like the rabbit church. He said, we just multiply, we just kick them out. But he said, we're just growing hand over foot. So back to this story. So he has a thousand people standing. And then he challenges them, are you willing to go to any nation of the earth? And he said about, about half of those, about 500, sat down. So he's left with about 500. Then to that 500, he challenged them and he said, how many thousands of Africans have been killed for their faith this year? And there were just extraordinary numbers. Then he asked only those willing to die for Christ to remain standing. He said somewhere between 100 and 150 stood firm and the other 350 to 400 stood down. And then he called those out. From the 2,000 or the 100 to 150 who are willing to lay their lives down for Christ. And he said, they're the ones who answer the altar call. In Western churches, what do we do? We, we drag people out like, like the dentist tried to do one time before the Novocaine or whatever he put in had taken effect on my tooth. And I'm yelling out, I can feel it. He said, I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> when, I, when I got home, I said, Ah, oh, it's finally gone numb. <laughs> and that's what our Western altar calls are like. So when, when, when Jesus was saying, this is what discipleship looks like. Can you see that we have, we have downplayed it, we have diluted it, we have made it suitable. We say, you know, we don't want you to be un un uncomfortable. Can I tell you, Christ will make you very uncomfortable. I know over the last two or three years I've been sharing a story how, how just walking outside, I think I was going up to pick up our car from uh, Bevel, and the Spirit of God spoke to me so clearly and said, you're pretty comfortable, aren't you? I thought, what? Oh, yes, I'm pretty comfortable. And then nothing more. And I'm waiting for some great challenge, you know, nothing more. And it was like, like he was saying, I want you to see as a Westerner, how comfortable you are. Because if you don't see how comfortable you are, and then you see, see what's going on around the world, you'll just build a little fence around yourself. But he said, you've, 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 got, to, you've got to understand that, that, that the call to discipleship is not a call to just come on and... and um, 
Some of you have heard of uh, Negrindle Research. It's a, it's a research company in um, Australia where they principally research the church. So the figures and the information they, they give is for the Australian church. And they said the new norm for church attendance in Australia is coming along on one meeting a month. He said that's the new norm in Australia. One a month. And so people come one a month. I said, well, tick that off. Good. Don't have to come in for the rest of May. And, and he's saying that we're, we're, we're just going backwards and backwards and backwards and backwards. So when Jesus is saying here, uh, it's a new way of living that I'm calling you to. Verse 36, 37. It says, what good is it for a man to gain the whole world yet forfeit his soul? What can a man give in exchange for his soul? And I'm sure I've met people over the years who've been affluent, who've had a whole lot of different stuff that I haven't had and, 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 and uh, hopefully never ever will have. But, but they probably looked at me and said, well, yeah. I mean, he doesn't have, have much. But I tell you what, what I have in Christ, I would not give up for anything. And, and if someone said, you know, or, or if you would yield or give over or what you've learned in Christ or what Christ has done in you for, for, for all the whatever, whatever, whatever. It, it used to be all the tea in China. But then I stopped drinking tea. And so that doesn't mean anything to me anymore. Maybe it's all the coffee in Brazil. That's a little bit hard. But, but, but it's like if someone said that, they would not give up what I have learned in Christ for anything. And all the money. And, and, and I've seen people who have had so much more, and I don't mean that, that if, you're, if you're affluent, you don't therefore have as much of Christ. But I know if you're affluent, you've got a bigger battle than I have. Because money is always coming in, and like God and money, God and mammon, fighting, 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 fighting. You don't have a great deal, and you've been spared. You've been spared from battles that a lot of other people have. Quickly, I'll do the last point. Oh. That one would just give up the way the world measures success. And the last one, point five. Christ brings our being known as Christians out into the open. So in the last part of Mark chapter 8 and verse 38. If anyone is ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous, sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his Father's glory and with the holy angels. He will be ashamed on that day if we're ashamed of him now. Again, the Crindle Research. In Australia, 1.5 million people, that's 1 in 17, say they don't know anyone who identifies as a Christian. 1 in 17, 1.5 million Australians would say, if they were asked, do you know anyone who would call themselves a Christian? 1 in 5 has said no. Sorry, 1 in 17. 1.5 million Australians do not know anyone who identifies as a Christian. I heard a story uh, this week where a man told his pastor he'd found someone else in their office who was a Christian. He, and this is what he said to his pastor. He said, we've worked in the same office for 12 years and I never would have guessed. That's terrible. If, if you work with someone for 12 years and they never would have guessed that you're a Christian, what are you doing? What are you doing? Sleepy. What are you saying? And I don't mean that you're, you know, you know, you're kind of getting your four spiritual laws booklet out. You just, oh, oh, I'm sorry, did I leave my Bible open on your work desk with with the Romans Road scriptures all underlined? You know, Romans 3:23 and saying, oh, did I leave it there where it said that you're a rotten sinner going to hell? Oh, I'm sorry. And I don't mean stuff like like that. But it, but I mean that that you simply stand up when the cause of Christ is before you. There are, I think, two great problems with Australian Christians on one level anyway. We have Christians who damage their testimony by how they speak and act. We have Christians who do everything to make sure no one finds out that they're a Christian. No one finds out. You know, at the um, conference I just, just, just went to, there was one night when they were arranging meals at different spots on the Gold Coast and uh, I had put my name down with a group meeting uh, in a, a restaurant called La, La Pochetta, some of you know, just off a couple more. And uh, I, I didn't know why they were catching a light train where they were going because we only 
where the conference was with literally seven, eight, nine minutes walk down there. So I just walked walk down there. When I got down there, no one else turned up. I waited, waited, waited. No one, no one, no one turned up. So I, I checked with them. I said, look, is there a group booked in here? And they checked, said, yeah, yeah, from the, from the uh, conference, AWA conference, here's a phone number. I rang the phone number and I just said, look, I'm just wanting to be sure I'm at the right place and we're not a missing bank. Then I got a phone call from uh, from uh, from someone at the actual where the group had gone. They'd all gone somewhere else. They'd all gone to another La Pochetta further further down the coast. I don't know why when this one was so uh, close. But I'm kind of thinking, what do I do? And, and I'm kind of looking around. And if you know where La Pochetta is, it's, it's, it's kind of in a little side, it's a side street that runs next to Cabal Moor, runs into a T, Cabal Moor, towards the uh, top part. And, and it's notorious for some of the clubs. Uh, you've got, um, I think, Hustlers one, and like, you know, really lovely sanctified names like that. And, and um, it's every couple of weeks, you see on the uh, news, someone got stabbed, someone got shot, uh, police, and you know, just in that um, street because it's just notorious, you know. So I'm kind of standing around waiting, waiting, waiting for so long. Got to chat with the manager, uh, got to know him so well that he's showing me, he's showing me on his phone photos of the x-ray of his broken foot. <laughs> he said, oh, no, no, no. And he was really um, tactile. You know, the people that just keep, keep having to kind of touch you. And there's nothing sexually. It was just kind of, he's just that, that kind of, you know, like a very friendly kind of, and he said, oh, ma maybe you can't see the break well enough. Let me just, you know, pull it up. And... <laughs> so you know, I got to know all about his broken foot and why he wasn't wearing a moon boot, and we got through all that. And then I'm thinking, I'm still standing there, and there's other a lady who looked like barely beyond teenage years, and she must be very poor because she wasn't wearing very much. And um, um, but she was from the club, I think, next door, which I think is a strip club, and, and she was very friendly toward me. <laughs> <laughs> Probably thought he's an old man with lots of money. Come this way. <laughs> so then I went into Cavill Mall and I just sat down. I thought I'll just um, I'll just sit down and this wild-eyed guy, and you 